Okay, guys, we're good. Look like it's better, right? And we better. I'm not seeing any comments though. Hold on, let me say something. Oh, there we go. It's working finally. No, Bobby, it's not working. It's freezing again. Mm. Maybe if you refresh, uh, you refresh it. We're going to stick with this for now. If you have issues, just refresh it. And if your typing works, let us know. And I can pause. Maybe we'll only get one chapter in today, but I'd rather you hear it. If you're freezing and you just let it know, you reboot it. Maybe you just hit refresh and the link will come back on. Just keep the link uh, copied. So you just paste it in and try it right now to make it work. As long as you can still hear, it, it works. All right. We're going to get ready to get going. Uh, other than, real quick, uh, other than number seven on the math today, was it okay? Were you able to understand it? Just say yes or no. Thank you, Adonis. Love when you're here. Other than number seven on the math, were you guys okay with that? Need to hear from Dean. Is Dean in here? I knew number seven was going to be a nightmare, so don't worry about that. I didn't like the way they 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 had it. Twenty three. Okay, I'll look at it when I get back. Ryan, what does nope mean? Nope, you didn't understand it. Well, Leah, we got to make sure our division. We get our division right. If we get our division right, it's not going to be hard. Dean, good. That means, yes, you got it. I'm very happy about that. Uh, okay, moving on. Did uh, you guys get to go to the, uh, to the zoo at all? I got to see the gorillas uh, earlier this Try to get in there and try to get those animals. It's pretty cool. Uh, I, I expect you to, I talked to Julia Madonna about this earlier. Don't just go in there one time, keep that link and visit it. You know, it's pretty cool to watch it. You know, when you have nothing to do instead of playing video games, maybe tour the zoo a little bit. Uh, I'm also going to put a, uh, the uh, museum of natural history is going to go up tomorrow. So it's going to give you something else to look at, which is really pretty cool too. Julia, when you when it's frozen, can you hear me? Because there's nothing we could do today if it's frozen. Unfortunately, you have to watch the live stream later. I guess it's the best way we could do it. Okay. All right. So, oh, and the writing. Tomorrow, just like today, I'm going to post a uh, another article. You're going to use that article, and it's going to help you figure out your boxes and bullet sheets. You need three main reasons, like three main ideas. And each one of those ideas, you need the uh, rhinos were there the whole time. The rhinos were always on camera. You should have checked the rhinos. And giraffes were always there. The ants, were, the best one was the ants. They were nonstop. But you're not frozen. I can hear you. Okay. All right. We're going to get started. Hopefully that uh, the kinks are going to be worked themselves out. Uh, I just want to make sure if you, if you understand what's going on with the assignments. Uh, tomorrow is going to be much of the same. All right. Today, last we left, uh, Booth was free. Everybody else was in jail. <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool, including Ford's Theater was in jail. So the only ones that are free are really the only ones that did anything other than Lewis Powell, who's now in jail, obviously. But John Wilkes Booth, the main guy that they look for, is pretty much the only guy that's free. So, yeah, I didn't see much of the grills and chimps either. In the morning I did. But we're gonna now we're, we're going to keep the chat line only to Chase and Lincoln's killer now. Okay, guys? All the discussions is over for now. 
I lost my voice. They arrested the building. What that means is nobody was allowed in it, and the ownership was taken away from the Fords themselves, and the government took it over. You coming in the light out with me? Come on. Come on, come up. Come on. Who are you asking? When you, whenever you're asking a, a vague question like that, Ali, you got to tell me who he is. We got 15 different he's in this book. Okay, here we go. Guys, I can't help you if it's freezing. No point in writing it anymore. I'm just going to do it. We're going to go through with it. I apologize. My only suggestion to you is you reboot it and then catch the lot, catch the video of it later because we, we're not going to stop now. All right? Too many computers are frozen. I don't know what's wrong. Uh, it's working here. I got full signals here, but watch it, the full video later. Okay, we will begin. What chapter are we on? Chapter nine. Reboot just by hitting, I mean refresh. Hit the refresh. Guys, I'm going to shut all the comments off because I don't think you're getting it. I don't want to hear if your screen is freezing anymore. There's nothing that can be done on my end, okay? The only, my only suggestion for you is to hit refresh. That's it. Okay, here we go. Chapter nine. Well, I am, I'm doing a live reading. When John Wilkes Booth planned the assassination and his escape, he did not prepare for an extended camp out under the stars. He focused on the need for speed, not camping in the forest of Maryland. Cowering like a wounded animal, fearful that every noise meant the hunters were about to seize him. Journey. He left Washington wearing the equivalent of a modern-day business suit. Unsuitable for camping out. Without a change of clothing, his garments quickly became dirty, ruining a key element of Boots' trademark winning style. His beautifully dressed, well-groomed appearance. He and Harold could not bathe or wash clothes and were unshaven. They looked and smelled worse each day. They looked like the fugitives that they were. Their looks might even jeopardize their ability to receive a proper reception. And the fine Virginia households they plan to call on across the river. Okay, so what's happening now is Booth, part of his, his charm was how handsome he was, how good looking he was, and how proper he was. But he smells. He's got a, a facial hair that's outgrown his mustache. He looks dirty. His clothes are a mess. So he's got to call, he's got to go to some fancy place in Virginia. And unfortunately, he doesn't fit in. He still has the intelligence. But he does not have the look that helps his charm. So he's a little worried about that. On the morning of Tuesday, April 18th, Jones paid his third call on the fugitives. With each visit, he risked capture, arrest, or worse. Soldiers had visited his farm several times and searched his house once. Jones handed over food and newspapers, then quickly left Booth and Harold alone again. Booth's curiosity about the country's reaction to the events of the last four days was limitless. Eager for the papers Jones had brought him, what controversial and often unpopular war leader into a martyr and a hero. Stories reported in the papers condemned Booth by name. Booth's reading in the newspapers, and he's not being viewed as a hero. He's being viewed as the worst villain in history. And Lincoln, who not many He's very concerned at how he's being viewed. The accounts of the Seward attack stunned Booth. Had Powell gone insane? Yes, Seward had been a target, but the viciousness of the assault shocked and revolted Booth. Why had Powell attacked the sons? Why did Powell attack his daughter? Why did Powell attack the nurse? Julie, a very good point about the North writing the papers. 
But when he read also in the papers that what Powell did, he do, he's like, what, what happened with Powell? Did he go crazy? We know what happened. And we know that he had to do all those things. He had no other way. Everybody was on to him. The only way, 20-year-old girl. So that's not going to go over well anywhere. Boots searched the papers for the article he had written the day of the assassination. He had entrusted the letter to an actor friend who was to deliver it to the national intelligence, was suppressing his letter. His friend that was supposed to deliver the letter was terrified of being connected to John Wilkes Booth. He never delivered the letter. He burned it. So we remember the letter that John Wilkes Booth wrote. He said, listen, to we handed it to his buddy, and he says, not today, but tomorrow, drop this off at the newspaper office so they can publish it. When this guy found out that Lincoln was killed by John Wilkes Booth, the letter he had, he burned it. He didn't want anyone to know that he had a letter from John Wilkes Booth because he would have been arrested. So he refused to ever hand it in. So John Wilkes Booth's story that he wrote, that's just what we know. Maybe years later, the guy came out and said it after he was not going to get in trouble. Yeah, but Julia, did Johnny Peanuts do anything? Did the building do anything? It doesn't matter if you do anything or not or know anything or not. If you were Booth wanted to explain why he killed Lincoln. He wanted the nation to know why he did it. He opened his small date book in a hurry, cramped writing. He began his new letter to history. He explained some of the reasons he had assassinated Lincoln. He longed for the South as it was and deplored the Union. He gave details about how he had committed the act. Booth was not the only conspirator shocked at what he read in the papers. In Elmira, New York, John Surratt read accounts that mistakenly identified him as Seward's attacker. Though John Surratt had been a conspirator in the kidnapping plan, he was not even in Washington on the evening of the assassination. Guys, can you imagine waking up one morning, reading in the newspaper that you had tried to kill somebody, when all that he was an assassin, that he tried to kill someone that night? Can you imagine being him? Scary for John Surratt. On Tuesday, April 18th, acting on what was now a stale tip, a cavalry officer decided to follow up on the information about the mysterious strangers who stopped by Mudd's farm on assassination night. Finally, people go to Mudd's house to check on what's going on. The, the soldiers sent for George Mudd, but as a witness, George Mudd was useless. He only knew what his cousin Samuel Mudd had told him. The manhunters decided to pursue the lead to its source. The men mounted up, headed for Samuel Mudd's farm, taking George Mudd with them. You think Samuel Mudd's going to jail now? When they arrived at the farm, the soldiers questioned. First, Mrs. Mudd naturally and did nothing to arouse suspicion. All would be well. Mudd told the soldiers the bare bones of what had happened. Two strangers on horseback arrived near daybreak. One had a broken leg, and he set the bone clean. The injured man rested in the parlor. The strangers did not stay long. He gave vague and general descriptions of the two men. One soldier asked if Mud knew the men. No, the doctor replied. They were complete strangers to him. Mud then attempted to send the man on, his, on a wild goose chase. Claiming the strangers asked for directions to a farm to the west. His story was full of lies and half-truths. He had passed the point of no return. He had given aid and comfort to Abraham, but he didn't get arrested there. Thank you for your help, Mr. Mudd. We'll be on our way. But, and he knew he would arrest him sooner or later. In Washington on the morning of April 19th, the most solemn day in the history of the nation began with the president's funeral. On Pennsylvania Avenue, thousands of people 
jostled for a place from which they would see the funeral procession pass as it left the White House. Six magnificent white horses drawing a carriage, carrying Abraham Lincoln's coffin, made their way up the avenue. Every building lining the avenue wept with black. The procession rolled slowly, the beat of the march measured by drums. Lincoln's funeral procession was the saddest, most profoundly moving spectacle ever staged in the history of the United States. He will get in trouble. Yes, Julia. When they ask people questions about how they know if they lied, they would never know. Can they pay them to tell you the truth? Can they pay you to tell you? I'm not sure what you mean. They didn't really have a lot of text. The text. And just so you know, a lot of tech to tests are not used in court. Police use them, yes, but you can't use them in a court of law. They're not admissible. So the police can use it to try to get someone to tell the truth, but if it, you're in court, it doesn't matter. It won't. They can't use it. Christian, I'm going to read your question again. Why did they? Why they ask people questions? How would they know they lied? Guys, if you lie, if you lie to a teacher, if you lie to a police officer, if you lie to a judge, if you lie to a lieutenant, they're able to know. I know when you're lying to me. I know when kids are lying to me. I know when my children are lying to me. You just know by their reaction. And that's what makes a good detective, a good general, a good lieutenant. They know. So he didn't know. He. He had a feeling this guy's not telling the truth. And I'm sure you've had feelings like that before in your life. When someone tells you something, you're like, I don't believe it. You don't have any proof, but you just think it. And that's what this lieutenant was saying. I think this guy's lying, and I'm going to find out eventually. So that's where we are. So, documents said, oh, in, in history. Thousands of citizens would wait for hours to view Lincoln's open casket under the great dome inside the Capitol. When the funeral was over, the president's body would be placed aboard a special train that could carry him home to Springfield. While tens of thousands of mourners viewed Lincoln's remains, the Texas prepared to raid the Philadelphia home of the assassin's sister. Asia Booth Clark, they searched for and confiscated anything and everything connected to John Wilkes Booth, including documents unconnected to the assassination. So now everybody in Booth's family is getting investigated. So imagine your brother or sister committed this heinous crime and the cops now at your house. Scary. In the early morning hours of April 20th in Maryland, two teams of detectives were planning a raid that would take George Azradot. He had spent the last four nights at his cousin's place, not moved to flee by the great risk of capture he faced. Azradot should have known the detectives would have searched his room at the Kirkwood house and discovered his connection to Booth. He had foolishly aroused suspicion when he made unusual comments about the assassination over dinner in the presence of guests. One of the guests reported his statement to a local union lieutenant who passed the tip along to soldiers who were now at the door at a Hartsman Richards place, the cousin of George Azardot. When Richter answered the soldier's knock, the soldiers asked whether Azardot was there. When Richter said he had been there but had left, a soldier said he would like to search the place. The house anyway. Richter then admitted that Azadot was upstairs. The manhunters found Azadot in bed. He surrendered without a fight, not even asking why he was being taken in. Azadot confessed everything, sang like a dog. The man questioned him, did not even have to apply pressure. Azadot told him many details about the plot to kill Lincoln, the kidnapping plot and the conspirators' final meeting on April 14th. He pointed fingers at Mary Surratt and Dr. Mudd. Now the War Department had its hands on two of the four men, Powell and Azardot, 
who were in the inner circle of the conspiracy. Following Azadat's arrest, Stanton issued a new proclamation. A reward was posted offering $100,000, which is an enormous sum for Lincoln's killers. The poster included photos of Booth, Harold, and John Saran, the most wanted men in the country. Here's the poster, the actual poster. It was $50,000 for John Wilkes Booth, twenty five dollars for John Surratt, and twenty five dollars for David Harold. Pretty cool poster. I agree, Ava. We're going to go one more chapter today, if that's okay with you guys. It's a short chapter. I hope it's not freezing too much and we can get this done. It's only five pages. Uh, Adonis, Johnny Peanuts is in jail already. He's going to, Johnny Peanuts stays in jail until after the whole boot thing ends. So he goes in jail for about 15 days. Okay, go. Chapter 10, page 144. On Thursday, April 20th, Thomas Jones witnessed the cavalry riding out of town on the news that the assassin had been spotted, spotted in another county. Jones concealed his excitement as the soldiers rode away. Once safely out of view of the village, he wasted no time in getting back to the thicket. He let out the whistle. <whistles> Harold appeared and led Jones to Booth. This late night visit from Jones could only mean one thing. It was now or never. It was now the time to go across the Potomac River. They had waited in the pine thicket for four nights. This was the night they would attempt to cross the Potomac River to Sanctuary in Virginia on the other side. The three made their way down a series of hidden paths and public roads, Booth riding the others on foot. Their first destination was Jones's farm. Jones slipped into the house and without word, scooped from the supper table enough food for two men and carried it out of the house. The fugitives ate, then immediately headed for the river. About a mile away, they would use a fishing boat Jones arranged for his servant to leave by the river. Jones waited in the shallows and brought in the boat. He and Harold helped Booth struggle into the craft, laying the weapons and crutches on the, on the hull of the boat. They handed him an oar to steer with. Harold settled in the bow, seat to row. Jones crouched down, took a candle from his coat pocket, and took Booth to take out his compass. Jones held the dripping candle over the protective glass cover and shielded the dancing compass needle, showing Booth the course to steer. Jones handed Booth the candle, cautioning him to hide its faint glow during the crossing, lest they be spotted by passing patrol boats. Then Jones gave Booth the name of a contact on the other side. I know it, it lasts a long time. It doesn't last 15 days, but I think that's how long he was there for. So I want you to think about this now. Who stole? He's freezing. Yeah, he took that long. He's still, I don't know. Uh, Jones is now putting them in a boat, and he's showing them where to go on the Potomac River. And then he's telling them, once you're in Virginia, go see the next person on the train. You know, if you know what I'm saying. The next connection is going to be in Virginia. If Booth can get into Virginia, his chances of success go from about 5 to about 20%. Right now, he's, he's not in a good spot. If he can get across the river to Virginia, his chances will go up. They're outlaws, Adonis. They are the definition of outlaws. As Jones grabbed the stern of the boat and shoved it off, a grateful Booth thrust a fistful of Union greenbacks at Jones. He gave him some money. Jones refused the gesture, 
saying that he had not helped him for money. Under protest, he agreed to accept just $18, the price he had paid for the boat. So Jones was like, listen, I'm glad to help you. I don't want money for helping you. I'm doing it because you did the right thing. But then he goes, I'll take the money for the boat since you're taking the boat with you. Pretty cool. Pretty cool that he did that. I, I mean, I disagree completely with where Jones stands. I'm against the killing of the, uh, the president, but Jones is a loyal guy. And this is what he believed. And he wasn't going to take any more money than other than the boat money. That's it. Jones showed them, show, shoved them off. Harold gripped his oars and rowed toward the Virginia shore. Yes, the right thing in his eyes, Julia. Great point. Two miles away, the river was dark as ink, and the boat soon vanished against the glass, smooth black face of the strong current under a moonless night. Thomas Jones never saw Booth, Harold, or his boat again. He made his way back to his farm along the deserted roads. One clever man had just outwitted the manhunters. While a frustrated nation sought vengeance, Jones had sheltered and fed the most hated man in America. They should be landing in Virginia about now, thought Jones. But while Jones slept peacefully, the first sign of bad luck hit John Wilkes Booth. John Wilkes Booth and David Harold were rowing in the wrong direction. Should we stop there? What do you think, guys? We'll end with him rowing in the wrong direction to find out tomorrow where they're headed. They wanted to go to Virginia. They're going the wrong way. All right, we'll keep going. Maddie, we'll keep going. Yes, Adonis. You're on your game today, Adonis. We're gonna we'll finish the chapter. We'll finish the chapter. Also, on April 20th, Dr. Mudd was questioned again by the cavalry. Mudd feared the authorities would discover some of his secrets very soon. He thought it might go better for him if he volunteered at least part of the truth. He told Lieutenant Lovett that the man with the broken leg was armed. Thus, he wore a false beard. Most interesting of all, he revealed to one of the manhunters that he knew John Wilkes Booth. He had met him last fall. In Bryantown, Colonel Wells found it odd that Mudd had failed to recognize a man he had met before, and not just briefly, especially when the man was so famous. After all, Mudd and Booth had met on several occasions in broad daylight, and Booth had slept at Mudd's farm in the past. After hours of questioning, Colonel Wells showed Mudd another photograph of Lincoln's killer and asked him whether he recognized the man in the picture as the stranger. On second thought, Mudd admitted, he realized that just now the stranger was John Wilkes Booth. Unintentionally and unknowingly, Mudd claimed, he had helped him escape. Exhausted by the questioning, after agreeing to return to Bryantown the next day to sign a statement, Mudd rode home. So Mudd now coming clean about everything. Now that I think about it, that was John Wilkes Booth. But I didn't know. I, 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 yeah, okay. They let him go home. Why? I don't know. But he's not going to stay there. Two more pages left. In a few hours, Booth and Harold would reach Virginia. Far, far wait a second. I'm on the wrong page, am I? Yeah. In a few hours, Booth and Harold would reach Virginia, far from the reach of Colonel Wells, his detective and Lieutenant Dana, and the cavalry. Mudd's lies delayed the cavalry's departure long enough to allow the fugitives to escape Maryland. Thomas Jones would eventually be questioned by Union detectives. They suspected that a man of his reputation must know something of Booth's escape. They arrested him and eventually imprisoned him but with no eyewitnesses who could place him ever with Booth and him not volunteering any information, he was eventually released. 
as was Captain Cox. Decades later, 30 years later, when his confession could no longer hurt him, Thomas Jones did tell his story to a journalist who recorded it for history. So Thomas Jones was arrested. So was Cox. They didn't say a word. They denied. Nobody saw me with Booth. I don't even know who it is. Why am I arrested? Just because of my reputation? You have no evidence to keep me. I'm not connected to Booth. Booth don't even know who I am. I don't know who Booth is. They let Thomas Jones go. They let Samuel Cox go because they had no evidence on them to keep them. At least Johnny Peanuts, they know, was holding the horse. They can connect him. They couldn't connect Cox or Thomas Jones. Years later, 30 years later, Thomas Jones told the newspaper reporter, yeah, I knew and I helped, but it was too late to punish him. You can't do something after that many years have gone by. It's called the sta statute of limitations. You only have a certain amount of times to be guilty for a crime. Harold dipped the blades of the oars. Now this is back on the boat. Harold dipped the blades of the oars deep and pulled hard. After spending so much time in the pine thicket, a lost week, it felt good to be on the move again. Who checked the compass bearings? They were supposed to be rowing from Maryland west across the Potomac to Virginia. This way. Then south. But the needle of the compass indicated they were headed north. Was the compass broken? No, the compass was true. Harold was a good enough navigator during the daylight, but not on the cloak of darkness and not haunted by the fear of capture. He had been rowing for far too long. They should be in Virginia by now. Hold on one second. Tessa, come here. Tessa. I don't know if you guys hear my dog barking. She's going crazy. His palms and fingers were sore, and his burning arm and leg muscles made it clear that they had already traveled too far. They had to land soon. Harold spotted a familiar-looking landmark, Blossom Point, at the mouth of a creek that ran north. The good news was that he knew the area and had friends there who would help him. The bad news was that they were back in Maryland. They did one of these. They almost did like a circle. And they went back to a different part of Maryland. And they were further north than they had been the night before. That left them vulnerable once more to Union patrols that were pursuing them. So not only that, they actually went, they went fur, they're further north than they were originally. So they completely went the wrong way. In the morning, Friday, April 21st. Booth and Harold gathered their weapons and blankets and headed on foot to the nearby house of a friend of Harold's, where they were fed and given information. Union troops and detectives were swarming the countryside, motivated in part by an enormous reward being offered by the War Department. The geography of the place they landed made it impossible for them to escape, except by crossing the Potomac. Harold and Booth would have to hide in the low-lying wetlands and wait to cross. At this critical moment, when they needed to escape Maryland as quickly as possible, they did something unexplainable. They did nothing. They did not retrieve the boat or row across the river. They sat in the dark and did nothing. They would have to spend another day hiding in Maryland until, follow until the following evening when darkness came. When Booth and Harold carried, the government pursued them with new energy. The evidence gathered at Mudd's farm, plus alleged sightings of the fugitives southwest of his farm, suggested that the assassins were going to Virginia. They knew Booth was lame on crutches. They knew he had shaven off his mustache. Horse-mounted ca uh, carriers and telegraph riders were alive all day with instructions to troops to enlist the help of fishermen and others on the river to capture the fugitives. It was day seven, and Booth was still on the run. And that's the end of chapter 10. And we are left with chapter 11. 11 is insane. Chapter 11 tomorrow is going to be insane. But 
It's a lot of pages. So chapter 11 is going to be a two-part chapter. So we're going to do two days, chapter 11. And then we'll conclude on Monday with the finale of the book. If we could get it one chapter done tomorrow, we will, and finish on Friday, which I would like to do. If not, we're going to wait until Monday. All right, guys? Uh, I was going to chat today, Jules, but we ended up getting caught up with the Neopods and everything. So it's just been a long day already, 40 minutes of video. I'm done talking. I'm sure you're done listening, and we'll catch up uh, with fresh talking. We'll probably wait till Monday or Tuesday with chatting because the book will be done. Maybe we'll have a day of no new uh, – Chase and Lincoln's Killer will be done. The new book that we're reading on Monday or Tuesday, we'll wait a day, and we'll just chat. All right, guys. We'll talk to you later.